Um, I want to start with May 1993. I know that's a long time ago. Um, at the Tucson Center for the Performing Arts, with support from the Arizona Humanities Council, in May 1993, I contributed as a scholar and performer to Viva España y México, a comparison of Spanish and Mexican dance forms, an event that featured Ballet Flamenco de Tere Aguirre performing flamenco dance with live music accompaniment and Grupo Folclorico Arizona Atlán de Tucson performing Mexican dance to pre-recorded music. Taking a cross-cultural approach, I helped write a narrative script that invited the audience to contrast and compare these two tradition, transatlantic dance traditions to see the qualities and attributes they shared as well as their differences. During one nighttime rehearsal, a folklorico dancer jokingly but rather pointedly challenged me saying, it's because of you that we have to do all this footwork. <laughs> she thought I was Spanish, which I'm not. She bl was blaming me for the intense footwork of Mexican folklorico dance traditions. Her belief in the essential Spanishness of Zapateado reflects a common opinion. In their book, Ritmos Indígenas de México, Mexican dance artists and scholars Nelly y Gloria Campobello expressed this viewpoint, arguing that the footwork dances of indigenous Mexicans are not authentically Mexican. Rather, they are evidence of the natives having imitated dances that were brought to Mexico by the Europeans generations earlier. To facilitate cross-cultural comparison, I find it useful to make several language distinctions. I use lowercase zapateado as a general term to signify the physical actions of flamenco um, footwork. I use uppercase zapateado with a capital Z to indicate the flamenco dance form in 6-8, a solo traditionally performed by male flamenco dancers that emphasizes virtuosic footwork, often with no arm movement at all. And this conforms to social conventions that discourage males from full participation in the potential sensuality of torso and arm movements. When referring to Mexican folklorico footwork, I employ the term zapateo. Usage of this term was preferred by Spanish dance scholar Vitucci Mateo, who noted it was used mostly in Hispanic folk dances throughout Latin America and Mexico for dances in which shoes, sandals, or bare feet mark a repeated rhythm. Spanish flamenco style zapateado and Mexican folklorico zapateo represent two distinctly different culturally inscribed ways of performing dance footwork, and some of those differences simply have to do with shoes. If I can make this go. There we go. How a human foot contacts the earth is always profoundly expressive. Whether it is the result of an individual's unconscious movement patterns habituated by cultural values, a culture group's collective expression of a dance tradition maintained for centuries, or a highly developed virtuosic expression achieved by an individual dance artist through arduous practice. Any analysis of zapateado and zapateo movements must begin by first recognizing the fact that dance footwear constitutes an apparatus that affects overall motor responses and therefore affects dance forms directly. Footwear affects a dancer's relative mobility, stability, range of motion, balance, posture, and stance. Uh, flamencologist Miriam Phillips, describing the effect of flamenco shoes on movement performance, also pointed out that flamenco's hard, high-heeled shoes or boots enables flamenco dancers to use more force. Likewise, the surface beneath a dancer's feet constitutes an apparatus. It, it contributes significantly to dance footwork traditions by either inviting or inhibiting different types of contact and sound production. Just as a wooden floor or stage may serve as a sounding board for flamenco zapateado, the wooden dance platform called the tarima or huapango amplifies the zapateo of Mexican regional dances such as son jarocho, son huasteca, and huapango. Historically, the influence of flamenco style zapateado on the development of folklorico style zapateo would have been accomplished through the acculturative processes of intercultural exposure and social engagement between the Spanish and native peoples of Mexico. Central to any process of acculturation is the human tendency toward and talent for mimesis, for imitation of a cultural novelty. And although the indigenous people of central Mexico may have quickly adopted footwork patterns from the Spaniards whose dances they witnessed, dancing with bare feet or sandals would have profoundly affected their movement, causing them to make significant movement adaptations. Ultimately, the contrast in footwear between the indigenous people of Veracruz and Yucatan 
and the Spaniards who first entered their territories in 1519 and 1517 respectively is likely at the root of the differences in movement technique we see in these dance forms today. Flamenco Zapateado and Folklorico Zapateo employ a different placement of body weight in relation to a dancer's base of support. Mexican Folklorico dancers from Veracruz and Yucatan maintain their weight primarily in the center or toward the back of the foot. This stance is conducive to performing Zapateo with the whole foot or the heels and causes the vertical mobilization of a dancer's body weight that gives Folklorico Zapateo its easy bouncing quality. This is seen clearly in traditional dance forms of Veracruz. Flat-footed or resting slightly back onto their heels, these folklorico dancers are grounded, energized, and relaxed, maintaining a comfortable posture and friendly presence expressive of Mexican cultural values. In contrast, weight shifts in the flamenco dance style occur with a minimum of level change or vertical bouncing. Flamenco zapateado emerges from a stance in which the dancer's weight is lifted up, hovering as if suspended from the upper body with the pelvis dropping downward and the hips free to sway and shift side to side. The primary placement of the flamenco dancer's weight is forward onto the ball of the foot, due in part to the architecture of the flamenco shoe. And again, I'm quoting Miriam Phillips. The foot is maintained on a slight decline, that is, with the heel always up. This causes the body weight to be thrown slightly forward. This stance is basic to flamenco, multiplying percussive possibilities by enabling the ball of the foot, the heel, or the tip of the toe to strike the floor. At other times, a deliberate shift of weight backward to the center of the foot or heels enables flamenco dancers to perform strikes of the entire foot or heel work. Outlining Spanish uh, classical dances codified in the Escuela Bolera repertory, Marina Groot distinguishes each dance style by the type of shoes worn for its performance. She identifies those dances performed in soft ballet style slippers known as zapatillas and those performed wearing dance shoes with a low heel known as chapines. Groot makes these distinctions because they truly matter, so greatly do they affect the dance. Did wearing boots with greater ankle support and heels give male dancers an advantage over females in performing zapateado in the 19th century? Was women's growing interest in and increasing ability to perform zapateado in the 20th century connected to the popularity of the sturdier Cuban heel reduced in the 1920s? Introduced in the 1920s, the answer to these questions are probably yes and yes. In addition to footwear and dance flooring, clothing is a significant factor affecting the movement range employed in daily life, the somatic sensory experience of the people of a particular culture, and the dance movements they perform. In an article titled, You Dance What You Wear and You Wear Your Cultural Values, anthropologist of dance Joanne Keali Inohomoku, as a, as a fundamental principle of dance research, said that costume-shaped behavior visually manifests cultural values. Furthermore, the values important to a culture group are often expressed in idealized, exaggerated, or stereotyped form through the wearing of specialized regalia, costumes, and other types of clothing that are culturally designated as appropriate for dance activities. According to Keali Inohomoku, the most obvious and seemingly universally valued movement patterns are those that distinguish behavior between the sexes, and these are always revealed in costume. Just as dance styles in the Spanish tradition reflect the co clothing fashions of historical periods and the normative gender expectations that guided personal and social behaviors of the people of Spain in different eras, so too the aesthetic conventions and expectations of flamenco dance are highly gendered. Hembra y macho, la malagueña y el torero. Flamenco aesthetics highlight the dominating power of zapateado footwork associated with masculinity described by flamencologist Don Porin as a symbol of strength and virility. They also value and admire the personality, sensuality, and emotional depth expressed through the marcaje and baile of the brazos, the dance of arms and torso, movements that Porin writes symbolize femininity and passion. An interest of mine for many years has been the, the combination between um, flamenco and bullfighting, so I'm going to speak to that a bit. Um, my book was published in 2015, Fl uh, Flamenco and Bullfighting, Movement, Passion, and Risk in Two Spanish Traditions. It outlines my intracultural intra research and analysis of flamenco dance and bullfighting, two movement practices, both of which originated in Spain, both of which have asserted significant transatlantic influence. I think of flamenco and bullfighting as fraternal twins, developing together embryonically 
born nearly simultaneously and continuing to develop naturally side by side in their home culture of Spain over a period of centuries. And later, through travel, conquest, and commerce, exerting transatlantic influence in Latin America. In addition to Spain, professional bullfighting today takes place in Colombia, Ecuador, Mexico, Peru, and Venezuela. And with flamenco, as with flamenco, bullfighting is subject to the ida y vuelta effect, the round trip flow of cultural influence from Latin America back again to Spain. As in Spain, the professional bullfight in Latin America countries is a small visible outcropping of a much larger network of interdependent enterprises that include things like cattle ranching, meat production, and public entertainment. Constituting a cultural complex, in Spain, flamingo and bullfighting are overlapping domains with many shared cultural values. They are cultural practices that provide people with opportunities to enact person, personal identities and social belonging. Within Spain, the social and aesthetic connections between the two practices are common knowledge. Similarly, from an international perspective, both bullfighting and flamenco dance are commonly linked and recognized as practices iconic of Spanish culture. As embodied practices, flamenco dance and bullfighting contribute to the construction of and stabilization of Spain's heteronormative gender identities, male and female, macho y hembra. Bullfighting is seen as a masculine pursuit, and conversely, dance is often considered a female domain. In his article, Gendering the Authentic in Spanish Flamenco, Timothy DeWall Malfa discusses the gender domains of flamenco practice and asserts that male relations in the public sphere are said to be competitive, where positioning and dominance over another male achieves social status. Masculinity is not a given but must be proven in actions, hence promoting vertical relationships of competition, display, and inequality with other males." End quote. Although Malefit's statement originates in the context of flamenco performance, it also elucidates why all bullfight practices are tacitly understood to pertain to the male domain. Whether bullfighting is practiced unceremoniously in informal venues or formally in the public arena, the elements of competition, conflict, and risk-taking reside in all forms of bullfighting and are associated with the male domain. Perhaps this is why high-level professional female matadors like Cristina Sanchez de Pablos may be simultaneously dismissed as attention-grabbing anomalies and resisted for their disruption of normative behaviors. An antecedent to the performance of La Malagueña y el Toero filmed by Auguste and Louis Lumiere in 1905 was the Spanish Escuela Bolera dance circa 1840, La Maja y el Torero. Both dances theatrically dramatized an encounter between a female and male protagonist, hembra y macho, and featured the flourish of a matador's cape as the two figures pass one another in an imitation of bullfight movements. This quintessentially Spanish romantic pairing of a matador with a beautiful woman, whether she is called La Maja or La Malagueña, plays out in some Latin American dance traditions also, Although, from what I have seen in Mexican dance traditions, the relationship is typically, more typically performed within a folk dance with many couples dancing simultaneously. And I'm thinking here of Toritos Son Jarocho in Veracruz and El Torito Serrano in Oaxaca, Me Oaxaca, Mexico. In the televised program, La Virgen y los Toros, Mexican novelist and essayist Carlos Fuentes Macias provides an overview of Spanish culture depicting a dualistic Hispanic worldview in which humans are governed by two systems of power, religious and secular, are constrained within binary, binary gender identities, male and female, and negotiate their lives based on an ideologically constructed ecology of separate realms, human and animal. Evidence of this dualistic worldview plays out in abundance in Hispanic dance forms. In flamenco dance, a whole complete human body is divided into two adversarial systems and a duality of expression ensues. Maneo, braseo, and marcaje performed by the upper body and associated with femininity give expression to smoothness, continuity, and sensuality, while flamenco zapateado performed by the lower body and associated with masculinity projects personal presence, assertiveness, and power. Through traditional flamenco dance movements, sexual identities are showcased in virtuosic performance and modeled in a variety of informal social contexts, becoming deeply imprinted in both personal experience and shared social realities. And usually, flamenco traditions either reproduce, impose, or reinforce heteronormativity as a central cultural value. 
Thus, La Malagueña is female with smooth voice and sensuous swathing hips. The traditional female, uh, female flamenco dancer lays special claim to the virtuosity of the upper body, articulate maneo, sleek undulating torso, and dynamic expressive eyes. Conversely, Zapateado is male, laying claim to the virtuosity of the lower body. The traditional male flamenco dancer performs the dance form, El Zapateado, as a tour de force. He simultaneously generates and defends his selfhood, authority, and strength through the dry, hard, assertive, uncompromising rhythms of his footwork. Flamenco's embodied performance of conventional gender identities functions to stabilize traditional cultural values and shield gender norms from social change. Many societies today, including those in Europe and Latin America, are changing due to the emancipating effects of new knowledge about the diversity of the biological expression of sex, gender identities, and sexual preferences. Sarah Pink, in her book, Women and Bullfighting, points out that an emphasis on the plurality of gender models, which replaces a bi binary gender system, stresses differences amongst rather than solely between men and women. A growing number of flamenco artists are striving to upend social expectations around these issues. This contingent of contemporary flamenco dancers, male and female, are daring to materially challenge the status quo by developing new movement vocabularies indicative of the wider social transformation. It may have started in the 1990s with Joaquin Cortez, shirtless, in the spirit of performative display, invites, invites attention to the express, expressivity of his upper body, torso, and arms. Marco Beriel choreographs and performs Suspiran, a male solo featuring a prototypical female Bata de Cola style costume. And Israel Galvan investigates upper body, torso, and arm movements, creating a uniquely masculine gesture language new to the flamenco genre. Creative innovation combined with public performativity elevates the social impact of these actions. These are not just informal transitory games of gender bending within a masculine enclave as William Washabaugh described in his article, Fashioning Masculinity in Flamenco Dance. Rather, when males venture into a bodily realm culturally assigned to the female's sex and pub publicly asserts creative agency within that feminine domain, the artistic innovations that emerge directly invite substantive social change. Flamenco performers engage directly in social transformation through public acts of artistic courage. I'm, I was st struck with the same um, uh, performances that you've seen earlier, the La Curva in Rotterdam when, uh, in tw uh, 2013. Israel Galvan, at the very end, uh, very briefly, was striving to break the masculine footwork conventions when he performs zapateo, zapateado, not from a strict vertical posture of the traditional male flamenco dancer, but with his weight supported by his back, by his shoulders, and by his hands. So he's really um, breaking that down. Through bullfight events, the, uh, the dignity and power of patriarchy itself is being affirmed in public space. Nevertheless, Cristina Sanchez de Pablos and other matadoras enters and disrupts the masculine domain of the bullfight arena with their female presence, strength, courage, and technical mastery. It might have all started with Carmen Amaya. Well, and there was others before her as well. But I think her wearing pants has some significance in terms of some of the things that I've said earlier. In 2010, Balaura Rocio Molina further transforms a socially constructed gender narrative by showcasing female technical proficiency, agency, and uh, creative agency and virtuosic zapateado in El Sol, La Sal, El Son, El Flamenco pa Patrimonio del Alma. Dancing within the tight constraints of a wooden structure inlaid within the dance floor, Molina creates brand new technical challenges within zapateado. She has added entirely new spatial dimensions and percussive possibilities, raising the ante, increasing what is at stake, and intensifying the physical and technical difficulty within a traditionally masculine domain. One of my intentions uh, in writing this paper has been to draw attention to the relevance of somatic perspectives in cross-cultural research. And, and arising from lived experience, somatic perspectives draw directly from the sensibility of the body's musculature and the neurological interplay between motor impulses and sensory awareness. This is a dancer's home territory, knowing the dance, movement, music experience from the inside. From that home territory of lived experience comes this thought. In normal usage, the Spanish verb zapatear means to hit with a shoe or in the dance context to stamp one's feet or drum one's heels. 
however, used figuratively. Zapatear means to stand one's ground. And it is this figurative use of the verb zapatear that I think must be considered to fully understand on a somatic level the cultural shift in gender roles, identities, and power that is at stake when female dancers demonstrate footwork mastery. Emancipation is afoot. From the phenomenal speed and forceful zapateado of Carmen Amaya in the late 1930s to Rocio Molina's extravagant zapateado self-challenge inside a confining wooden box in 2010, the efforts of flamenco artists, of a female flamenco artist, to first master, then creatively transform the traditionally masculine domain of zapateado are both culturally significant and socially consequential. And one other thing, uh, if, if there's time, we can look at just a little. We're, you're just at 20 right now. Ah, OK. Well, if you haven't seen that performance by Rocia Molina, it's really phenomenal. Um, and she has literally, in terms of space use, brought in new, new dimensions. Um, whereas she is able to stay in that little space and go to town. Um, with her zapateado, I thought it was really interesting that Isabel Galvan seemed to get into that situation very briefly and get out of it. And this really does have to do with like what are these constraints and what does an apparatus do to dance? You know, the shoes, the box, the all that kind of stuff. So can thank you very much. Can you tell us 30 seconds? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, I think I can. It's right at the beginning, so it should play. Well, we're going to YouTube, so once you do that. Yeah, you know. <laughs> See what I mean? We would like to skip that very much. Thank you.